today. Uh, my name is Mel Buchanan. I'm the curator of decorative arts and design here at NOMA. Um, Works with these galleries and had the pleasure of putting together this small exhibition on G's bin quilts. I normally can give the gallery talk and talk about how much we admire the um, artistic genius behind this community of women, these African American women in G's Bend, Alabama, that produced this very rich textile expressive tradition. I could talk about that easily with enthusiasm for half an hour to 45 minutes, but today instead we're really going to focus more on the conservation of the textiles because we have with us Howard Sutcliffe. And Howard is an independent textiles conservator working out of Montgomery for, Montgomery for now, um, mm -hmm. the River mm -hmm. Ridge River Region. Uh -huh. Sorry, I'm getting the name of your River Region oh, okay. textiles conservation. <laughs> But we work with Howard to um, do any type of textiles conservation work we need here at NOMA, including this acquisition of five G's Bay quilts that came in last year through the Souls Room Deep Foundation in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so they were new to the museum and they came in in pretty good care. But anytime you are taking anything as fragile as a textile and putting it out in public view, there are some concerns. For, um, for display. So I don't want to put you on the spot and turn it right over to you, but what are the types of things in general that you're thinking of, broad picture before we jump into any of the specific quilts? Like what are we thinking of when we put textiles on view in a museum? What are the problems? So uh, the main problems um, are from a, from a point of view of kind of like uh, preservation going forward once a, an object has come into the museum is uh, light and then the environmental conditions in which they exist. So textiles are really amongst the most um, susceptible object types to types of damage um, such as light, um, so which is why this uh, area is kind of like quite uh, dimly lit um, because obviously the dyes can fade um, quite easily. Um, the uh, relative humidity um, yeah, of the environment um, has to be fairly stable. Um, we don't want kind of like large fluctuations because that can kind of like cause damage um, to objects long term. And also um, a nice, clean, insect-free environment because the other, the other major aspect of dealing with textiles is the things that kind of can uh, damage them. Um, and really with that you're looking at um, protein fibers, and so you have things like clothes moths and carpet beetles that will just kind of go to town on wool, and they're also quite happy to eat through other things to get to the wool as well. So there's there's a lot of things to think about. So we, we're planning, so you can't just take a quilt and say, this is a magical work of art, let's put it on view, and we'll leave it there for five or six years. So the, the main thing we do in a museum is just limit exposure, uh, because it's less light, it's less physical stress on the textile, you know, even if they're mounted on a slant or in a case, or especially when they're hanging vertically on a wall, if there's some inherent um, wear, um, not to mention subjecting it to us coming in with our visitors and mm -hmm. our, our mm -hmm. fingers, mm -hmm. which we've never touched the quilts, but um, it's just at a higher risk. So we limit exposure time. So the kind of there's a general, general rule of thumb for every one month a textile, same for works on paper or watercolors, every one month that it's up on view, it goes to storage for a year. So in a situation like this where we have these quilts up for six months, that means for the next six years we're really going to be looking at yeah. keeping them rested. So they'd only be available for appointment viewing or um, you know, do good digital pictures online but not available. So this is a really wonderful chance to be able to see these great artworks. Um, maybe jumping a little more specifically, when these quilts came in, some of them had been on view in museums before, so were prepared. Others were simply a, a quilt like you might have at home on a bed, and there was some, some processes you went through to help them be on display here. So maybe you could point out um, kind of the hanging mechanisms and, and what you did there. Exactly. Well, uh, I guess kind of like we start at the beginning of kind of like the process of conservation. So, um, so generally, uh, when I first see an object, um, do an examination report, which is basically um, looking at the, the condition. And for that, um, I'm really looking at uh, uh, soiling to begin with, kind of what type of soiling is on the quilt, whether it's particulate, if it's sitting on the surface, or whether it's ingrained into the, the structure of the textile, whether it stains, if it's creased, um, 
And then uh, if there's any kind of structural damage. And so we did do that with the quilts. We looked at photos of them, and then I was able to um, give you a proposal that basically tells you how much time I'm going to need to kind of like come here and work on these things. And so um, uh, with all of that done, um, the first uh, step in the process was cleaning them, and I do that using a uh, low-powered vacuum suction, which is a very fancy way of saying that they were vacuumed, um, <laughs> but with a very fancy vacuum. We're not just kind of like running a Dyson over them. Can I also say you have certain textiles you wrap around the end of the nozzle? Yeah, yes. yeah. Well, I have, I have a, a very fancy very cool. um, vacuum that uh, has a variable speed control, so you can take the suction down and it has kind of like little micro attachments. So I'm kind of cleaning, you know, a quilt that size with you know a little brush that's maybe an inch, you know, uh, big. So that takes that takes some time, but um, it also gives you time to kind of really you know look and assess the, the condition of the quilt. Um, so anyway, once they were they were cleaned, they were um, generally humidified, um, just to help kind of like flatten them out and. Uh, relax the fibers. Is that a um, kind of way of saying steam? Like what? Kind of. It's a more gentler version gentle of steaming. steaming. <laughs> um, and so we use uh, a material called Gore-Tex, which most people are familiar with from you know, winter coats. Um, and so it comes in sheets, and you spray one side with water, the felty side, and then the smooth side goes against the textile, and you kind of gently weight it, and you leave it for kind of you know, 30 minutes, an hour, and um, it introduces uh, uh, moisture very gently into the fibers and helps them to relax. And so, um, you know, the sheet is probably two, three by three feet. So you kind of uh, work your way across the surface of the, of the quilt. Um, if there's any areas of structural damage at that point, um, you can kind of like realign those, ready for when those get supported. Um, but um, it's, it's really a way of just kind of like relaxing the fibers and making sure that any creases from storage um, have been removed and so, you know, it, it's going to look good going forward. Um, so what do you say, like, so in some of these quilts, like, where maybe you've, you've had pieced fabric and one, they, the seam has come undone, so one of the mm -hmm. pieces of fabric might have flipped up. Exactly. That's what your chance to come kind of like, you know, creeps, fold it back in, yeah. kind of like make sure, um, it lines up, and you know, when you have uh, something like a hole, which we'll talk about in a little bit, I mean, this one had numerous holes in it, um, you're able to kind of like align those edges uh, just to make sure that everything is uh, nice and flat before you um, support it. So, once everything's nice and humidified, uh, we moved on to the structural uh, support phase, and um, this quilt in particular was, was the problem child from that point of view. Should we move over there? Um, so, so yeah, yeah, we can have a look at uh, this one. So this one, the one next door actually had kind of like numerous holes, but this one is a little bit more interesting. Um, and so this is uh, a real mix of different um, materials. There's a lot of Cotton, um, you know, obviously you have printed cottons, plain cottons. Um, we also have uh, silk, and the silk blocks uh, are used there? to be there. <laughs> they used to be there. We also have kind of like uh, some man-made fibers, kind of like rayon and um, acetate and things like that. Is it velvety kind of thing right there, a little texture in there? Yeah, yeah, there's all sorts of stuff in there. So, um, so the problem with uh, silk is that, um, uh, let's see, it gets, um, it is, to begin with, one of the more structurally unstable natural fibers. Um, it's a more crystalline in structure, so it doesn't last as well as cotton and wool. Um, and part of the inherent problem is the way that it's processed. So um, you start out with uh, your little, um, Silk cocoon, your little silkworm produces its little cocoon and that gets boiled um, and then kind of it breaks apart in the water and you get your silk thread. Um, the thing that keeps it in the cocoon is kind of like gum that holds it in place and that's kind of uh, where most of the weight of silk uh, comes from. And silk was always sold by weight and so 
the merchants were kind of like losing half of their um, products when the gum went away in the water. And so they then used to soak uh, the silk threads in heavy metals, things like chromium and tin, uh, to kind of add the weight back. And unfortunately, those chemicals were not particularly um, uh, friendly towards the fiber, and so they really kind of um, helped to uh, deteriorate it pretty rapidly over time. And we get kind of what we call uh, shattering, where the silk just kind of like breaks apart like a pane of glass and just falls to pieces. So that's what you are seeing in these pink areas. So just to, to clarify, you're looking at like the pieces of pink, the white is the cotton batting yeah. in the middle so of the quilt. The so yeah. when we, there's, there's actually almost nothing left there, just those spots of pink. Is that a colored uh, cover? It is. And it that's is. what we get in power. Exactly. Well, how do we deal with this power? So, um, there is, uh, obviously, I'm a textile conservator. A lot of people know what restoration is. Um, the two are interlinked but quite separate. So a restorer is trying to make something look like it did when it was new, when it was manufactured. A conservator is much more concerned with um, preserving what's left, basically. And, you know, there's varying degrees between those two sides. So, with this, um, uh, the, the best method of uh, support for what was left of the um, shattered silk was basically to cover it with an overlay. And we have different overlay materials. Um, and I brought uh, a couple of examples that I can pass around in the back. Um, so the first one, and it really depends on the problem as to what you use, um, the first one is a very, very fine nylon bobbinet, uh, of which this is kind of like uh, a ton of different kind of like little off cuts that I keep because, you know, it's what conservatives do. You never know when they're going to come in handy, especially for, you know, the quilt blocks. Um, and so this stuff is uh, woven by one company in the UK, in the Midlands, and they use um, 19th century machines that used to be used for uh, silk stockings, and um, they use, uh, they you know, make the nylon net now rather than silk. But the nice thing about the nylon is that it can be dyed to any color. So um, again, I think uh, Mel um, got a tiny little piece of uh, the pink that had fallen off the quilts mailed it to me in Montgomery, and then I was able to dye the net uh, to match um, off-site, and then bring it back here to kind of like do the support work. So, um, I like, just, so that's kind of an interesting conversation. Like we just go with pink, but we're clearly not trying to make this look like that solid pink exactly. block. You know, we're trying to be very honest. So the net, you know, the net does its job, it's kind of like supporting what's left of the silk, it's protecting it, but also by adding that colour in, you're just kind of like giving a hint of what the block used to look like. So we're not kind of like trying to uh, disguise the damage in any way, I mean it's very, very damaged, that's what it is, but you know, we're also, it just gives you a little bit of visual um, clarity by adding in that colour. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. Um, no, that's part of the order. Well, there is, it's kind of like uh, some of the cottons too that were glazed. Uh, the glaze is uh, caused kind of like problems for the, for the fibers. And um, so some of these cotton uh, patches also have um, the net on top as well, just to help protect those. Um, and this is another type of fabric um, that we use for overlays, but I mostly use this now for um, stitching. So all of the stitching is done using threads drawn from polyester crinoline. So you can see that they are um, pretty fine. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you have to have good light, and uh, so far I've been lucky with having good eyesight. To, uh, to be able to use all of that stuff. So, um, so anyway, uh, this one had kind of like the shattering blocks. Um, so that gets the net on top. This one behind the mail um, had a few 
small holes that kind of went you know, all the way through. And so for those, I used a, a cotton underlay patch behind the damage and then kind of like a net on top just to kind of like hold everything in place. Um, and then this one. Um, Can you find out where one of those was? Um, I think it's in the purple, kind of like down here. And also this area of the, uh, the edging is missing, so this piece is new. Um, but there's a couple like that throughout. I'm sorry, you're interrupting us. No, no, no. So, um, so you don't necessarily use all the natural products when you're storing? No. Um, I, well, I mean, it depends. So, I mean, you know. Cotton certainly, um, but yeah, we do use a lot of uh, you know, handmade um, uh, materials as well. Um, with the conservation, a big part of it is documenting what we do, and so it's very, very clear to um, surveyors and conservators that come after us um, what has been done. Um, you know, certainly I've you know worked in large art museums where conservators from the 1960s and 70s would just kind of write, wet cleaned. It's like, well, that doesn't really tell me anything. Um, so nowadays, we really, uh, we will photograph everything before, or take, uh, you know, in-progress shots, um, and then photographed afterwards, and then there'll be kind of like a, a you know, a treatment report that will um, tell you exactly what has been done. Um, and so, for these, after um, the structural work had been done, the structural support work had been done, um, we then went into kind of like thinking about the excavation phase. And so, um, to protect the quilts from, uh, you know, painted surfaces, uh, like walls and things like that, um, we actually lined them. And so, um, if I just kind of like... These are lined using um, a cotton sateen fabric from a company in Pennsylvania called Test Fabrics. And um, it is uh, pre-shrunk um, cotton sateen, and so uh, over time there should be no dimensional changes to the cotton. So it should be you know, nice and stable for like the next you know, 30, 40 years. Um, and that just gives it kind of like, again, you know, uh, another layer of protection on the back. Um, and then these are all hung using uh, Velcro strips. And um, we pretty much use uh, Velcro to hang kind of like all sorts of you know, flat textiles from you know, huge European tapestries to quilts and um, all sorts of things. Yeah, I like that it's a, it's like, is it a six inch deep or four inch deep? It's a very wide. Uh, this one's two. This one's two. Yeah. In my yeah. mind, they were very wide. I know. It's, it's kind of like it just has like, a lot of. Oh, yeah. Basically. So the Velcro is belt. stitched onto uh, a wider cotton strip. Maybe that's the socks. Yeah. That's probably what you remember, and then it's the the cotton that actually gets stitched to the quilt rather than the Velcro itself. So the idea just um, being to, I guess, disperse the weight across yes. as wide yeah. as smooth yeah. as possible. So, um, there's only one strip that holds it, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I mean, a two inch strip of Velcro will hold a, you know, a 26 foot tapestry that weighs, you know, 400 pounds. So, it's kind of, so. The, yeah, the next thing there's also the, the boards, which that kind of comes on our he left us with instructions for how to create the exact um, width of the board that has the kind of the, the male and the female end of the Velcro it goes mm -hmm. on the board, and then that board is notched. So, when we go to actually install. We have a board that up on the wall yeah. that has a little how do you, how do you describe it? Like a, it's kind of like a cleat. A cleat. Yeah, Thank you. That's what cleat. Yeah. And then the matching cleat that has the Velcro on it. So down here on the table, we can line up the board, the Velcro, and then we just have to go cleat right up on the wall. Mm -hmm. So it's a very smooth, easy yeah, process. Yeah, it's, it's very, very easy. And you can kind it's of see cool. if you can look at the edges, you can see the two cleats, and they're wrapped in. What is that silver foil stuff we got? Uh, it is. Um, it's wrapped the wood in. In the UK, it's called the moist stop, but it's kind of like an aluminum. It uh, looks like aluminum foil. Uh, it's, it's basically you know very similar. Um, Some sort of conservation grade yeah. aluminum foil that yeah. costs more money than. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You give it a fancy name and kind of you know, yeah. charge more for it. So. Um, but does it protect? I guess off gassing. It is. Wood? It's yeah. off gassing and it's kind of acid. From the wood. 
that basically that you're protecting against. Um, and uh, and yeah, the lining process um, was fairly simple for most of the quilts, and you can see that they're hanging pretty you know, flat against the wall. Um, this one was a little bit more challenging, um, just because of the uh, the tension that has been you know built in by the quilt maker, um, probably unintentionally, but um, you know it's just the way that it, this one came out. That's what you mean. Um, we, we weren't talking much about the the ladies of G's bed, but the traditions were to follow your own voice as opposed to following a pattern. Yeah. So you had this great improvisational quality. So when this, we, we were literally, she was making decisions and reacting to the materials that were very available, which is a very different way of quilt making um, than other traditions. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have this kind of loose but improvisational um, artistic genius, really, or artistic yeah, beauty. Yeah. But also because of that, you're not thinking of like different weights of fabrics that might mm -hmm. over time create this Exactly. And also not thinking about it, you know, one day ending up, you know, hanging up. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like, this is my bed, it's to keep me warm. Um, and so, you know, kind of like the, the ripples along the lower edge are much less of an issue like that. But um, with this one, yeah, it was, uh, you know, you kind of move in one direction, it moves this way, you kind of like change that little fold, it kind of like keeps it out in another way. And so putting the lining on this one was something, you know, a little bit like horror. <laughs> like, you know, tanning it up and, you know, moving it around. Um, and so it, it mostly hangs, you know, nice and flat until you get to the bottom edge. But, um, and uh, I was you know, able to leave uh, Mel and her team instructions of kind of like, well, if it does this, kind of, you know, kind of like, if you pin it up, you can adjust the lining a little bit by <coughs> taking it in this way or letting it out. Um, so, uh, you know, they ended up looking pretty great. Uh, no, so it's all it's all hanging from the Velcro, which kind of like really gives it a, a you know a nice even spread, um, and they're not you know they're not super heavy. Um, Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Well, you were talking about exhibition, and I was wondering earlier I mentioned the one month one year rule. Yeah. Why did you guys decide not to put them behind glass and maybe just let it for longer? Um, well, the, the, I guess we could have had UV filter and glass, but simply for us it was expense with the show. Um, I, I did work on a quilts exhibition with the Winter Fair Museum, and it was, they were earlier material, 19th century American quilts from when I turned to travel an exhibition. And in that case, they had a very serious conservation team, and these quilts were going out on view to a go tour for years. So there were probably five quilts that had to be on a slant board, so they didn't have this vertical stress and then maybe five or more that also had to be behind a plexiglass barrier and on a slant board. It, it was, I mean, you know, well, it was $15,000, I think, to get those five quilts on display. And that was in addition to the rest of the show. So it was, it's simply the cost of the materials and the bill. So for a little show like this, we couldn't do that. And still, it doesn't necessarily prolong, you know, no. it gives you a little more time, but, it, yeah, so you're a concern. Exactly. But no, I mean, the only way to really kind of like do that would be to rotate them in and out one at a time. Um, but obviously, yeah. you lose the impact of, you know. And that didn't affect the light all that much. That was more about the stress. And in that case, they were more concerned that they were sending these really delicate early 19th century quilts out to, we went to Milwaukee and St. Louis yeah. and Virginia. They don't know the audiences there. And, and that's where you have hundreds of people coming through. And not really knowing the environment, so like, you know, will someone be able to just come up and touch? So they were ensuring that their most valuable historic assets would be protected, you know, even when I was in charge of them in Milwaukee. Um, you know, so that it was um, known that they would be protected from people. So did you actually wash any of the books? Yeah. Um, actually, these five were in. Uh, Pretty great shape in terms of kind of soiling and staining. Um, some others that I have uh, looked at for other museums that came from the Salisbury Deep Foundation um, do have needed kind of a lot more work. Um, uh, certainly, I washed a couple that uh, ended up at Birmingham uh, Museum of Art, and um, there's uh, one that actually uh, just ended up in Montgomery. Pieces that didn't wash to the bicep, but that's 
and then put that together. But these uh, these files are actually in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. Weird, yeah, yeah. This, I mean, in the, the conditioning, I almost directly list how old they are. But mm -hmm. this, with the, 19, oh, the early, the earliest, which is why we picked it for this five, it's 1928. So we wanted to show the range of the 20th century quilt making tradition. So we did the earliest we can. This is also on the earlier side, 1955, coming from work clothes. It needs a little more work. But as a counterpoint to that, we also wanted to show that the tradition continues. It's still active today. Mm -hmm. So the blue jean quilt is uh, 2002. Um, so you know, like, by that point, 2002, the ladies of G's Bend and their quilts were famous. They've been on US postage stamps. So uh, when Mary Lee Benbell made that quilt in 2002, she's making it as an artwork for a museum, essentially. And it needed, what kind of work did it need? Maybe? Uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, you know, folded, yeah. vacuum, just is a, you know, it had been on display and, you know, folded up in storage. Um, but I think that even had the Velcro already on it. I think so, that one yeah. did, that had yeah. been on view um, in yeah. the exhibition. Well, I know I've certainly seen images, beautiful images of women in G's Bend hanging the, the bolts out on clotheslines, so I assume that means they were washed and out um, hanging in the air. I haven't. I haven't. I have do you make sure you stop and have a talk with Exactly. <laughs> Because someone had asked at the beginning of like about information for caring for folks at home. I don't, did we get your your questions answered, or do we have anything to add to? Uh, <laughs> but you know, I mean, it's really uh, you know, if you're not using it, it's more about storage and you know how you keep it. Um, I have it in a hospital case right now, which is so good. Which kind is of good. Agree with yeah, yeah. You can buy, I mean, even you know, places like the container store, you can buy acid free boxes and um, you know, acid free tissue paper. Um, if you have it folded, mm -hmm. um, I would, you know, kind of refold it a couple of times a year, just so that the creases don't set in place. Um, and then, really, you know, the best place to, uh, you know, unless you have like cancer or anything like that, the best place is to kind of, you know, store it under the bed. Um, it's generally, you know, within a Domestic environment, the bedroom tends to be the most stable in terms of environment. Um, so, um, but yeah, you know, washed muslin is good. I mean, obviously, you know, a lot of the fabrics that we buy for them, you know, German fabrics and things will have kind of like finishes on, so it's always good to wash them before you use them for historic testimonies. Yeah, the first process that you talk about someone laying the quilt out and using the cheap like the square piece of fabric that had been loosened might not kind of get out any creases or anything. Mm -hmm. What fabric did you use for that? Uh, well, that's Gore-Tex, which um, can be, you know, difficult to, to get now um, in, in sheet form, but um, if you just kind of, you know, if you have kind of like creases in your quilt, um, I would just, you know, if you have kind of like a spare bed, you can just lay the quilt pants on for a little bit. I mean, generally, you kind of like time will help to kind of like just have the clothes, you know, drop out naturally without um, uh, using moisture. The thing, I mean, the thing with like having to use moisture in textiles is you don't have to react. Right, and that is possible. And so, you know, there's a whole testing, you know, uh, process and then it goes on before we move on. And there's no need to, I guess, from age things to 